So um, we'll refer to the grant, but really what this is is our work at, at Sammamish High School to develop a school that meets the needs of all of our students and prepares all of our students to be successful in high school. Um, we were quite honored to receive this grant. Uh, if any of you are familiar with this particular grant, it was a very competitive process. Uh, Forty-nine of them were awarded nationally. Um, we were the only recipient in, in Washington State. And, and I think that's um, because we have uh, developed a great team at Sammamish, but we also have developed um, strong partnerships, um, including with Dr. Conley. And what we're going to endeavor to do today is to show how we're thinking and using Dr. Conley's work to inform our practice at Sammamish and really um, take seriously this notion of college and career readiness. The four years we have students and really there's lots of elements to the grant and, and we could talk actually for several hours, we won't do that. But really to, to focus in specifically on this notion of how do you know if students are college ready? And move away from this idea of minimum standards tests. And, and we're a school that has pretty mixed results on those um, for, for a variety of reasons, but we also have, for over the past 10 years, really focused on making sure that our students are in rigorous courses. And we'll show you some data that um, shows that. So let's go ahead and do the next slide. So um, we have about 1,100 students, grades 9 through 12. 41% uh, of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch. If you were to live in this local area, that surprises a lot of people, as they, they assume that, that Bellevue is a suburban city with um, this pretty affluent. 11% um, of our students qualify for ESL services, but a much higher percentage of our students are actually English language learners. They've just reached a point of uh, mastery where they no longer qualify for services. Um, about half of our students are students of color. Um, the, the number, um, we're somewhere in that 85 to 90 percent of students, and, and we're, we're proud of this, who are going on to college, have aspirations for it. Um, but we, for quite some time, have known that it's not good enough to get them into college. We really have to focus on making sure that they have the skills and knowledge to be successful in college. Um, this last, uh, in these last two pieces of data are actually um, from Dr. Conley's work uh, in developing a school diagnostic system. We, we were actually pretty surprised by this last number. Maybe we shouldn't have been, but that 44% of our students who we surveyed last spring reported they would be the first one in their family. If it had been a four-year degree, I wouldn't have been a surprise, but to be the first one uh, to earn an associate's degree or higher in their family. So um, we really aspire to have a school that has a college-going culture. I think we have a lot of elements of that, but we're always thinking about, well, what can we do? Um, because going to college in the United States is, um, becomes kind of a, an institution in families, and if you don't get that started, um, kids just don't know what they need to do in high school and they don't know what they need to do. And they also don't know the opportunities that are out there, that if they do well in high school, there are resources to support them as they move forward. So um, I'm going to turn, turn this over to um, Kim to tell a little bit of our story over the last, I guess, about four years. Yeah. So. Um, so we started this work about four years ago, as Tom said. and. Um, we recognized that we weren't doing enough for our kids, and we realized that um, we needed to teach the, the skills for our students to be ready for careers, and then for, for college to get ready for the careers. Um, and we read some research, and uh, uh, Dr. Connolly's research, and a book by Tony Wagner called um, uh, Global Achievement Gap, and it really struck us that um, there's this huge need to um, have our students learn these skills to get them ready, not just the content, but all of these other skills, problem solving, communication, things that you've been hearing over and over today. Um, and we also, at the exact same time, because I'm a science teacher, um, several of us started to hear all of this talk about STEM. 
and it became really um, this national push to educate our students to um, go into STEM careers because we're just not doing that now. We need to change what we're doing in public schools to prepare our kids to be successful in STEM careers. And so those two ideas kind of melded together. Um, we also looked at our student population and uh, we had known for a while that we were not preparing our students to go right into college credit classes. They were having to take remedial math, uh, remedial English classes. And we uh, at Sammamish had looked at our gaps in um, some of our populations, and uh, we knew there were gaps that we needed to close. Is there something you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to. It, it's, we have a bit of a tale of two cities at Sammamish. So, while we do have a number of students who were worried about them being prepared for college math, we also have um, over this year over uh, 100 students who are in AP calculus and 30 students who are beyond that of a graduating class of about um, you know 250 to 270 students. So, so we have some students that are really doing well because of our work, and so a lot of this grant was focused on. You know, how do we take the students who are not at that level and get them there? Were you? I think, no, I, I was finished. Okay. So I'll introduce Bill. Um, Bill Palmer is going to um, continue for a little bit. All right. We uh, organized the rest of this just around the, the four needs that students need to have in order to, to become college and career ready. So I'm just going to talk about the first piece there, the key cognitive strategies. Um, I think what happens when you write a grant is you come up with some kind of proposal that if we do this, we expect this will happen. And so um, our proposal essentially for this grant was that most of our efforts would be around uh, creating teacher groups that would design problem-based learning. So you'll see a lot of overlap with the previous presentations. The problem-based learning is about the doing as well as the learning. Um, and in defining problem-based learning, we got some help thinking about key elements that we would um, call. So we've come up with seven key elements of problem-based learning that you see on the, the left. Um, and I thought it was interesting how well they overlapped with the key cognitive strategies. So we, even though we did the work separately, there's a, a lot of overlap with what the skills that students need to be able to learn uh, in careers and colleges. So uh, a couple things that just to touch on, authentic problems for us means that the problems we create for students are, aren't just real life problems, but they also have some meaning for the student's own life personally. Uh, examples of this would be uh, freshmen come into Sammamish and the first thing they do in an AP Human Geography class is a demographics unit where they're trying to get to know the class of 2015. So who are our students, where do they come from, what's the income levels, what kind of languages do they speak at home, all those kind of pieces. So they're not just learning about um, something abstract, they're actually learning about their school community and doing the work of a demographer as they're learning. Um, using expertise is important to us as well, that we don't just ask students to um, learn from a book, but we're bringing in experts at the national level, the local level, to help students see what the work looks like outside of the high school. And that also gives them a chance to get feedback from people. And uh, I think that relates to the precision accuracy piece that am I talking the right way? Am I using the right data? Do I have enough evidence to back up my claims? Uh, academic discourse is an important piece to us, that if they're in a science class, they talk like a scientist. If they're in an English class, they write like the project demands. Um, an authentic assessment, I think, is similar to um, what you've seen with uh, other pieces from the previous presentation that the work they do um, is, is related to a real task and it has some kind of portfolio or project component to it. Um, one example that um, is actually common between both Envision schools and our school is what's um, come from an AP Plus program. So we have an AP Environmental Science course that actually has a pretty well developed set of problem-based learning challenge cycles they're called. Um, one of those that I was able to participate in is called this ecological footprint. So the actual project that students had to do was to come to a, a real person or organization and say, for your event, we want to help you um, figure out what is actual the, the carbon footprint, what resources are you using, and how can we help you plan that an event that is actually uh, going to save resources, is going to minimize the amount of uh, carbon you're putting into the environment, other pieces like that. So they actually helped one of our student teachers plan her wedding and did a whole um, 
imagine one class of 30 students breaking into five groups and each group has to then put a proposal in front of this teacher from what silverware to use to actually where to host the event to what kind of foods they should provide. So uh, the problems are a very engaging piece for the students and I think that is what we're um, counting on to drive the learning and to make sure that learning is something that they retain past the test and past the, the school year. Um, Another thing that uh, we don't have image for, but that has really driven a lot of our science work is an aquaponics project, where students get about a month before um, 500 fish arrive in the mail. And this happened yesterday, so it's kind of fresh in our mind that we get a big box full of tilapia. Tilapia? Yeah, uh, a bunch of fish. And uh, the students have that month before they get the fish to actually set up the tanks to plant the seeds to get all the pieces of the system ready so that these fish will survive and actually be able to be harvested by the end of the year. Uh, what is interesting about the project is that um, that need for students, um, I'm not quite sure how it was expressed earlier, but the sense of the teachers not handing out the information, but students have to become reliant and figure out how to do things on their own. Uh, interdependence is what happens as a result, that we're not giving them a handout that says, here's how to plant your seeds, but they know they have to do it. So research and the other pieces that you see in key cognitive strategies come as a result of having a task and having to figure out how to do things. And there's a consequence if they don't figure it out. Yeah, so I'll say um, about key content knowledge, I think that one piece of this kind of problem-based learning, and I think it's, it's uh, kind of exemplified by the deeper learning that Envision Schools was talking about as well, is that you're setting the knowledge that students are learning in a context that they can relate to, they can retain, they can, they can hang it on something in a framework. And it's not something abstract that I don't know why I'm having to learn this, that my teacher's telling me this. But this is something that relates to me as a voter. We had students in our ninth grade um, class just a few weeks ago as we were teaching nuclear chemistry. They had to think about, would you take a stance and be for or against nuclear power in the United States? And can you back that up based on what you know about nuclear energy? You're going to be a voter in, these are ninth grade students, you're going to be a voter in three or four years, you know. So kind of taking them into real context. The aquaponics um, system is a good example as well. Aquaponics is a uh, kind of a self-sustaining system that uses fish and plants to work together. The fish waste fertilizes the plants. The plants clean the water for the fish. Um, the kids learn about it as a sustainable means of agriculture. But they also have to keep the systems going. They have to work in groups um, over the course of the year, which is something that's challenging for the kids as well. And they have to learn those collaboration skills. Um, if there's fish, you know, if they're, if they're not taking care of it and the fish die, that's a real, you know, kind of consequence or whatever that there's responsibility for the students. We um, are in the process as a district, Bellevue School District, of aligning all our assessments um, with the Common Core standards as they're coming out with the English, um, English language arts standards, the math standards, um, the new uh, science standards is the framework that just came out and the science standards will be coming out in, in a year. Uh, we also as a district um, have had a move for the past probably almost 10 years, I think, really to focus on advanced placement courses as a measure of college readiness. There is a K-12 real curriculum alignment um, with getting kids ready that as they're coming in, all our ninth grade students at Sammamish now take an AP course, an AP Human Geography as their social studies course. Um, tenth graders are in AP Sciences and AP World History and um, we've opened up the access so that any student, there's, no, there's not a, a track into an AP course or, a, or an AP track or a not AP track. But any student can take those AP courses and we encourage them to do so. Um, we have about more than, more than half of our students um, are enrolled in AP courses. And I think probably every, the average Sammamish student takes three or four AP courses probably before they graduate college. Again, thinking about key content knowledge, what is key content knowledge? And obviously in a, in a changing society, that key content knowledge might be changing and might be important um, for students to know what is important, um, not only if I'm preparing a future scientist, but I'm preparing, as I said, a future citizen or future voter for someone to be literate about all these kinds of issues, even if they don't choose it as a career field. So working with um, outside professionals. Last year in, um, in our uh, biology chemistry course, we worked with oceanographers and biologists around a unit on ocean acidification. So how, how do we help kids understand 
the, the increase in carbon dioxide in the environment is not only changing climate, but it's actually changing the chemistry of the oceans, which has a lot of impacts on living things. So bringing in those outside experts to say, what are some of the key issues, and to actually work with our kids and have them be able to have our kids be able to go to the labs and see what those scientists are working on. I think partnerships is a big um, piece of what we do at Sammamish as well, and obviously, any of these things I think are not, you know, panaceas in and of themselves, but thoughtful partnerships with colleges that we have locally. Bellevue College uh, is right down the street from us, the University of Washington in Seattle, um, trying to get students to think about what does it take to be at college, have role models, have contact with college professors and college students as well. Am I doing the right thing? So this is a graph as well of um, the AP trends. So. This is data from last year before we had the ninth grade AP course. Um, so it's, it's much higher now, but those 478 students taking over 1,000 AP exams um, at, uh, at Sammamish. So. So how do we develop the learning or academic skills preparing kids for college? Um, we have the AVID program at Sammamish and in other Bellevue schools. It's the advancement via individual determination. So this is a program that is targeted at kids who are in the middle and kids who are probably going to be the first ones to go to college in their families. Um, they're uh, real... Uh, or, um, structured around organization, study skills, how do you be su successful in high school? And hopefully that would carry on into college. Things like Cornell Notes, getting the kids um, to learn in peer study groups are uh, highly stressed. Um, we also are doing our, our college uh, career ready diagnostic, school diagnostic. We did that for the first time last year and that's through the Educational Policy Improvement Center. Um, and it has given us uh, tremendous information. We're just starting to dig into all the data, but our plan is um, to use this data then to inform our professional development with our teachers and with our, so therefore with our instruction with our students. Um, and uh, hopefully over time we're going to see, uh, as we get our college and career ready diagnostic in, uh, data back every year, we'll see improvements every year. Um, so um, here is one uh, screenshot from the results or the data from that uh, diagnostic. And this is um, broken down. Um, into a lot of detail, but the thing that was really interesting here was that the question asked of the students was, what collaborative learning strategies do students use? And, and the students were supposed to answer this, you know, for themselves. And um, the one, um, s you know, smaller broken down section of that was, I study with others outside of class, only 54, excuse me, 54% said, this is not at all like me. So a little over half of our kids say, basically, they never study with their peers outside of class. And that is a big deal to us. So that is something that, you know, we have now learned. We can um, put into play strategies to uh, encourage students to study with their peers outside of class. And in fact, I've done that this year in my AP biology class. I'm requiring um, peer study groups. And so as our uh, other, several of our other AP science uh, teachers are doing that as well. Um, how do you help students understand the admissions criteria? Uh, application process and financial aid process. So this is the, um, you know, how do you get into college? Uh, we have so many students, 44% reported they would be the first ones to go to college. So all of the, um, the mazes you have to traverse to get there. Um, so our plan is to um, have, well we are currently this year, we had all our 9th, 10th, and 11th graders take the PSAT. So that helps them understand some of those admissions criteria for like passing the, um, the uh, that's the SAT, right? Yep, that's the pre-SAT. So uh, passing the SAT, so they get that feedback and they start in ninth grade so they, they can learn what areas they need to improve in every year. Um, and then our goals for this year are to have every single senior apply for college. 
Um, and every eligible senior is going to fill out the FAFSA form. Um, and we're going to do this uh, by using some support systems. Our counselors at our school are really good at identifying students that need extra help with this. We have a volunteer program called the College Corps in the whole Bellevue School District where we have mentors coming in, volunteers coming in and sitting down with students one-on-one, -on -one, help them uh, strategize and look at uh, possibilities for colleges, how to fill out the application, help them with their uh, college entrance essays, um, and give them all kinds of feedback and support. Um, and then uh, uh, asking all of our students to fill out the FAFSA this year is going to be a new project. And so um, we're putting a plan in place where we're going to bring in some new volunteers who have ex either experience with the FAFSA or um, some kind of accounting experience to be able to sit down and help our students uh, do that. Because we have seen data that, um, and I believe it is from the uh, Chicago public schools, that um, they have tracked this over time that uh, they have a huge correlation between having students fill out the FAFSA and then having students enter college. So it's a it's a, a really huge to get them to do that. Yes. Do you know that data? Because that that is data I'm not familiar with. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that we've tracked the data, but what happens, we have really good systems in place for students who are going to four-year colleges and go through that process, but, um, but we want students who you know, talk about going to Bellevue College, which is a local um, uh, community college here, to have, to have the application done, because the, the four-year colleges have pretty firm deadlines, but a lot of the two-year schools do not. And students will tell us that they're going to do that, but we have no way of really knowing. So we've started saying, you know what, we're going to track. We're also um, planning to ask students to, you know, share. I mean, share their acceptance letters, and really not just to get into a two-year school, but to have um, aspirations towards what they're going to do in the future. And, and I think that's one of our big challenges: is that. I, that I think relates directly to what Dr. Conley said is that um, a, a lot of our students just don't have that clear goal of where they're going and kind of think it's going to fall into place for them. And, we, and, and we're pretty sure from you know, talking with alums that the longer they wait to get things started, the less likely they are to get them started in terms of college and, and moving forward. Well, I, here, here's, here's, here's the rationale for why, is they may not be interested now, but if they don't have a family that has that knowledge in the family, we want them to have the experience of going through the process. So if at some point, two, three, four, or five years down the road, they do decide they're interested, it's not a completely you know, abstract concept to them. It's something that they can concretely know, hey, here's how I do this. We, um, I mean, we, we, it's a, so we have several um, what would be career and technical education options. Um, the more we've dug into this, though, and I can share those, we don't think the skill, the skills that students need to be successful in a, in a more of a vocational career, they're still going to need to do post-secondary education. And the skills, frankly, if you want a living wage job, are not that much different than what you need to be ready for college. So we do, um, our current program has health sciences, we have some engineering, graphics, but, but there, I, I would argue that there is no high school vocational program that prepares students for what the skills that they'll need for the, the future. And so we're really focused, if they choose to go to a technical college, we think you know, one of our criteria is getting students to successfully complete pre-calculus. And we believe that that successful completion is going to serve them well 
regardless of what path they choose. And, and, and we don't think that we, as a system, can afford to have students in high school making choices that are not very well informed. I think it goes back to Dr. Conley's presentation that this idea that there are kind of traditional blue collar jobs out there that are living wage jobs, I, I just, I don't see that existing. And we really, you know, so to say that you don't have to get through pre-calculus, and we, we, we're in a district that has a three math credit requirement, but we have almost all of our students take math their senior year, so they're well beyond the three credit requirement, which would take them through Algebra 2. I, and I, did, I, did I answer your question? I mean, I, I took it a little bit different ta tangent. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I think that oversimplifies what we're doing. So we do have, um, you know, our counselors start freshman year um, working with students, talking about college, talking about the process. Um, we do. Uh, in addition to the PSAT, we do the ACT plan, which actually provides some good data in terms of career interest and career interest inventory, and we have their database accessible to students so they can start making connections. And the other thing we didn't talk about much that we're really working to do through our expert and mentor network is bring professionals in to be resources in the classroom, both for teachers and for students. Um, so that they're making connections. So last, um, uh, last spring and continuing into this year, we had several volunteers for, from Google, for example, so that they're we're volunteering mostly in math classrooms, so that we start having students make connections to things that they hadn't necessarily thought about in terms of a career. So I think a lot of us tend to think a lot about what our parents have done, and we're trying to broaden that out and, and uh, have them have other experiences that do lead not just to college, but that they're thinking beyond. Because I think when you go to college with the goal of where you want it to be in the future, you're much more likely to successfully complete college. Just one of the things that you We, we do, I think that, but I think the reason, and, and um, so my answer to that is that we're looking for external validation on that we have a rigorous program. And AP is definitely something that's recognized that way. Some of the courses are pretty um, content focused and less skill focused, but the, the one we mentioned, the AP Environmental Science, and we've also taken another AP course um, AP uh, US History and Politics uh, into a problem-based approach. And we don't think those two things are exclusive, that you can build the skills and the knowledge. And so we're, what we're doing with those courses is we're saying, you know, the end-all be-all isn't the necessarily the score on the AP exam. We want you to score three or above because that is a college readiness indicator. But we also want you, like in the AP uh, US Government and Politics course, to, to understand how the government works. One of the things that, that students engage in is um, a mock Congress. So they actually take on that they're a representative for, for some area in some state. And you know they're either part of the majority party or the minority party. And they learn the whole process, so they have to study their community to figure out who, who it is they're representing, what their interests are. And then they're taking that to Congress, and they're going through a real, you know, a, a system, you know, they figure out pretty quickly that if you don't, you know, if you're in the minority party, it's really hard to get something to the floor. So to figure out how to make that happen, I mean, some of you are you're probably pretty familiar with that, depending on which side of the aisle you're on now. And, 
And what we've seen is the students really are engaged. And what was interesting is the, the students who resisted that most were some of our students who were traditionally really good at school because they knew how to play the game. And it was like we threw them a curveball. And now we said, no, you really do have to apply this knowledge. You have to think about it. You have to figure out, you know, and once you understand how the system works, you have to figure out how to make it work to serve, you know, to, to in these, you know, and they do a mock UN and, and other things in these challenge cycles. So I don't think it's a question of AP or not AP. It really is a question of making sure that we're, we're, we're thinking purposely about content knowledge and skills-based knowledge and skill development. Right. So while that is one of the testimony one thing, you know, the reality is that there's there's also a lot of pressure on kids and there's a movie uh Places of Nowhere by uh Jim Wilson talks about the pressure on kids to perform. And I think along with my honorable uh representative from uh Vermont. Vermont. It is in Vermont. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I think it's always a fair question, but I think historically in public education, we haven't pushed kids nearly hard enough. And, um, and you know, some of our kids come from, from families where multiple families are living in one apartment. And I think that's pretty tough also. And I think in, in the U.S., you know, the one thing that, that, that I hope is an equalizer is education. And... Um, you know, in my own experience, it wasn't the teachers who made it easy for me that moved me forward. It was the ones who challenged me and pushed my thinking and, and were, were willing to, you know, to take some pushback. And, you know, the last thing I'm going to argue for, I mean, big reason that we made this move towards problem-based learning and really implementing it is that, that we're not going to be a test-driven culture school. We're going to be a learning-driven culture school. And that includes both... Um, student learning, but professional learning. I think that, that that's been as big a part of what we've become as a school. Because I think, unfortunately, there's this notion that, that, that teachers, and I'll include myself, because I, I, I still consider myself a teacher, and certainly did it for a number of years, um, that somehow, we don't do this with any other profession. We don't assume a doctor, once they get that degree, is at a master level. We assume that they're going to continue to learn and work with their colleagues and peers. In education, we need to do the same thing if we want to have the, the, le the quality level in our classrooms and that we want the outcomes for all of our students to be productive citizens who, who you know, move through college and have um, worthwhile lives and, and meaningful careers. So I, I really do push, um, you know, in that notion that, um, you know, our, a lot of our kids are facing real challenges, and, and you know, it's a real, it's a great thing to see a kid who you know is coming through from a real challenging background to get into college and to be successful. I mean, there, I, I think of one student who graduated a few years ago. His name's Jose. Um, he's a senior at the University of Washington now. He's over a 3.0 GPA, and his mom um, delivered newspapers to support his family. And, um, you know, he's, he's a unique case. I, it's hard to take credit for a student like Jose. But what I worry about is I think too often we're a barrier to a student like Jose um, that we don't see his potential and, and challenge him. And he spoke Spanish as his first language, but if you want to think of an interesting challenge, he studied French through AP French and moved through the system that way. And so, you know, um, and, and I think we really need to... Um, Think about what the possibilities are for all of our students. You know, if, if we're really going to be competitive in, um, you know, in, in a global economy, we, we've got to make sure we're, we're giving our students the very best. Because you know, I hope in the future we're getting their very best. Any other questions? questions. Um, can I say something? Sure. Go ahead. So um, we actually uh, found. Is it okay to say this? We found out we were going to do this yesterday or two days ago <laughs> and um, so we uh, just briefly today talked about you know 
what do we want the audience to take away as far as what, what we would like to see in policy? And we didn't have a chance to make a slide for that. But what I would like to say is as a teacher leader, I have learned so much collaborating with my colleagues and whatever policy that you can think of that helps teachers be able to work together, collaborate, learn, um, have professional development, and then to grow teacher leadership. Um, we will just blossom from the school out. Um, I just, I can't say how much more change will occur if we can get the teachers to take this on. Um, we need reform. We need this new collaboration, these new ideas. But it really needs to be allowed to grow from the teachers up and out. Um, and that's what we've seen at our school. And we have a wonderful, great principal leader as well. So encouraging those principal leaders policies to encourage them to allow teacher leadership and that shared leadership at their school. It has made a huge difference for us. Uh, yes, Marcy. Well, I'll, I'll just say quickly, and then I'll let Tom um, add. I think, from my perspective, I've not, this is my 20th year teaching. I've been at Sammamish for 17 years. And ever since I've been there, all of my colleagues have always had that belief. Um, and so, you know, it's always been permeating what we did um, to not give up on anybody. Um, but I think we, we looked more closely when we planned the grant. We looked more closely at the data. And we use the data to target um, some of the um, some of the changes that we wanted to make and some of the improvements that we wanted to make. Yeah, I I, I, I think that gets into you know really you know this notion of what public education is about, and, and if it's not about all kids, then, then what what is it about? And um, and I think that. Um, that we need to, you know, the thing that, that does happen is students learn at different, you know, in different ways, different paces. If, if a student comes to Sammamish, you know, as an ESL learner, if they're a beginning ESL student, are we going to get them to perform at a high level on an AP English exam their first year? No. But what can we do over time that builds their skills and knowledge? And, um, and we have had students who you know have been in a sheltered ESL class their freshman year, and by the time they graduated, they were in an AP English class and, and passed the AP exam. And so, um, and, and I think one of the things that's interesting is every time we try to um, you know raise the bar and we think that we've got a high enough standard, we keep finding that 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 kids show us they can do more. And so I think you know we really have to believe in our students, believe in their capacity to learn, and do our very best to, to, meet, to meet all their individual needs. And that's, that's a challenge, you know, when a teacher has, you know, at the high school, our teachers teach five classes, and they're going to have, you know, 29, 30 students in every class. Um, but the more we can do as a system, as a school, so that we're working together as a team, and make the connections with the students, make sure that we have the right interventions in place, the right supports, um, you know, our, our kids do amazing things. And, and, you know, and we're always looking at the ones who aren't and what can we do as a next step to help them get there. <laughs>